our guest for the night and she can help us work this out? Uh, you know, I was I was thinking we, you know, should try to solve it by ourselves before we ask for help, but she has been waiting patiently for a long time and presumably has way more important stuff to talk about than we do. So um, I, all I will ask, Nicole, is that you spend about 10 seconds uh, stalling here while I go ahead and uh, find our guest intro. Okay. Um... No, never mind. I found it. Oh. <laughs> Do you want to let, let me introduce her before we? That's a pretty great video. Yeah. I'm... This one took me about longer. <laughs> All right. Hello, and welcome to Giselle General. Um, she is a city council candidate for the upcoming Edmonton election and a giraffe onesie enthusiast. Um, before we get into Kelly's thing, I want to know, Giselle, what is your favorite way to pet your pet a cat and or dog? What's interesting is, um, like in my house here, we've never had our own like pets, but we have roommates downstairs mm -hmm. in our basement suite with pets. So we are more like the slightly more hands-off cat auntie and uncle that mm -hmm. will say hello while our roommates are about to take the pets out for a walk um and when we have pets sit with our friends um my husband is a very good um cat bed so he would be lying on the couch playing video games for hours and then the cat would be like on his chest while mm -hmm. i'm like being the slightly like distant but loving auntie so like hey i won't interrupt you because your your uncle my dear husband is being a cat bed so i'll let you be so that's more of my style mm -hmm. yeah. yeah it's like having yeah a partner that's really good with kids and you're like good for you and like you still get to like babysit and stuff but you're like you go do your thing over there i'm just gonna be over here making snacks that's right <laughs> that's yeah. nice I'm wondering if we can dig into this distant but loving uh, anti idea. Like, Jessa, what's your, what's your kind of vision of um, uh, of distant but loving? Like, is it is it sort of something where you're like, uh, you know, like you you're completely genuine and emotionally available, but like just physically distant? Like, you're only supportive from across the room. Yeah, pretty much. And, you know, like making sure that um, I guess I guess my husband and I would be as a team, like make sure like the water is refilled and food is there and whatnot. And I guess I'm more of also like more of like a verbal, you know, like, hey, button, how are you enjoying your uncle over there? <laughs> and, um, you know, and, and if, if and well, we have actually pet sit up uh, two of our friends is cats, uh, Button and uh, Pippin are their names. They're both uh, black cats, super adorable. But um, yeah, I would more like greet them and stuff like that and make sure their basics are met. So that's more, yeah, that's kind of how I do it. Yeah. Nice. <clears throat> All right, so where were we at with the with the emoji hearts? Well, we had not yet started. Hmm. Mm. That's, that's uh, you know, that's a good a place as any to start. Mm -hmm. So let me just hold on. Let me just bring up the emoji hearts and see what the different ones are. And I was I was really proud of myself for having them all loaded up before we started the show in Discord. And now every time I try and talk to Paige about her tech problems, then I keeps losing it. But we're back. Okay. So first and foremost, we got the red heart, which I mean, I could be wrong. I feel like this is a genuine expression of love like hey i love you is th is this a controversial opinion i mean I, I feel like that's yeah that's pretty basic although like i how are you differentiating that from the other colors of hearts well this is what we're going to get into mm -hmm. so if this is our baseline wh what am i telling someone when i send them the orange heart uh I mean, yeah, I don't know. How much do you love orange? Because I've been told that the yellow heart is like, hey, on the down low, we're just friends. Like, is this, is so this that's a commonly like held like belief? The, I mean, that's, oh, so that, that kind of like goes back to that like roses thing, right? I guess maybe that's maybe how we can like gauge this is like, if you, if someone gets you red roses, that's like kind of more romantic love. 
where it's like, I know my dad has got me like yellow roses before for Valentine's Day as like a platonic, like, here you go. It's roses and it's nice and it's cute, but it's like, weirdly needs to overstate that it's platonic. Does like, is there more than, is there like, a, do the roses have meanings for more than two colors or is it just like a red yellow dichotomy? Um, I don't know, actually. I've never had, I've never, I don't think, received roses of any other color. That's not true. I got blue roses, but I got them from my mom. So I'm assuming that was also platonic, though I can't speak for her on that. Hmm. Okay. So here's, here's my pitch for the team here is if the orange heart is a pretty much a middle point between a red heart and a yellow car, heart on the, on the color spectrum, and red is I love you, and yellow is, let's just be pals. Is orange kind of the friends with benefits heart? Is that what I'm getting out of this? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm down with that. Like, you know, if you say like, hey, you want, uh, love to have you over tonight, orange heart, it's like, love you have to have you over tonight, but I better not see you in the morning. Like, maybe that's sort of, maybe that's sort of what's coded into it. I don't know, Giselle, what do you think? So basically, you, you, when you decode it, it's like Netflix and chill. <laughs> yeah. I think so. <laughs> mm -hmm. Orange, you glad they didn't send you a yellow heart? <laughs> Orange, I glad you didn't make that. Oh, you did. Hmm. <laughs> oh. Okay, so now we've got the green heart. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Giselle, you got a green heart in your text message. What's your first reaction? And it's not St. Patrick's Day. You get a green heart. What, what's your reaction? Um, for some reason, the first word that came up in my mind is solidarity. Like, I think I would, I can, t you know, on my Twitter and whatnot, I can totally see it. Um, it's not even through text messaging, most likely through Twitter, like talking about like a political topic uh, and whatnot. And I can actually see some kind people, you know, putting a, as a comment, uh, a green heart, just like a sign of like empathy or like, yeah, I hear you. So yeah, yeah. not sure if there's like, like logic to that, but that's what came to mind. Okay, so now you're not less, you, not necessarily you don't necessarily know this person, but they're saying like, "Hey, I, I feel that feeling," or "I know what you're talking about," or "Okay, yeah, I can get behind that." Mm -hmm. I'm gonna make a note of that. I feel like I can use that. Mm -hmm. So we have one data point here for the blue heart, which is that Nicole got one from her mom. So I'm wondering if it helps to notice what kind of relationship Nicole has with her mom. Like, is it healthy? Uh, I don't know. Are you my therapist? <laughs> I mean, some days, some episodes of this show, it feels like it. Mm, that's fair. Uh, yeah, I think we have a pretty good relationship. Um, yeah, I like call her a few times a week. We chat an appropriate amount. We lived together for like three years in my t late 20s, which some people may find weird, but... I found was actually quite refreshing. So what you're saying is it's possible that the blue heart is the like, I love you, but you got to move out of my house heart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like kind of like a bruised heart, like, like a cool heart. Like, I love you, but like the intensity of this relationship is chilled for me. Yeah. And I need to like, get <laughs> out. That's the, uh, I think as Giselle put it, the uh, like, affectionate but distant heart mm -hmm. like i would like to love you from further away i feel like that tracks <laughs> mm -hmm. and then the purple heart goes with a saying as we all know i love you and also i've been wounded in combat and service of the u.s military so that's i mean that's right over the plate i don't think there's any question of that mm -hmm. i don't know unless there's other uses you've seen it for mm. I did see it once for, um, oh gosh, this joke is going to be a lot funnier if I can remember the name of the character. What's that purple guy from the McDonald's Grimace? troop? Grimace. Yeah, <laughs> specifically for people that like really love Grimace, like big fans. Or like, I love you the way Grimace loves. Does Grimace love hamburgers? I'm not even sure. I, th I seem to remember his thing being chicken nuggets, but I'm not, I might just be making that up because he's kind of shaped like a chicken nugget. Hmm. Now, as we're talking about this, I do remember that I did promise Giselle no pop culture references. <laughs> uh, and we're, we've already blown that promise. 
True. Well, I mean, if it's international enough, then maybe it's okay. Like I did, I did have McDonald's where I immigrated from. So well, I yeah, but did works. did did Grim did Grimace make it to the Philippines? Actually, yes. So you know, um, yeah, like. I mean, I I lived in a small mining village in the Philippines, so I would the only time I would see McDonald's and the characters is when we go to the city. But yes, that uh, you know, purple figure is uh, pretty familiar. But for for kids in the Philippines, like our attention is split because there is a comparable um, um fast food franchise as well, and they also have characters. So we have to think about like, is this from McDonald's or is this from Jollibee? But uh, with, I, I do recognize the character. Is that, sorry, that's Jollibee? Yeah. And do they have a purple character? No, they don't. Hmm. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of like the the, the filters. Like, oh yes, um, purple McDonald's. Maybe that's why they haven't made it big internationally is they just don't have a purple character to sell their brand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they made it, they were pretty big in uh, Calgary. They opened one up and there was a lineup around the block apparently when it opened up. They... And I think the first like three or five people got like a year's year of free Jollibee. Yep. It was like a whole Wait, big for real? thing. Yeah. Do they, do they have it in Edmonton? They have uh, four right now or three. Whew. Okay. I feel like yep. I've never seen one. Well, then, okay, clearly they have made it internationally and I'm just uh, the fool here. Hmm. So, uh, okay. So I guess the real question here is, do we believe Grimace is a creature capable of love? I mean, how do we this define is, how are we defining love in this situation? I mean, this is a thing I don't know, and this is a thing I expect my city councilors to be able to define for me. So, <laughs> can you define this abstract concept concept for us, please? Yeah, can mm -hmm. I, I want you to? I, I want all of my councilors, um, especially the ones I'm not capable of voting for because I live in a different ward, to be able to walk into those council chambers, sit down flop down their big, cool, heavy, like leather folder of files and opinions and be able to just state firmly, this is my belief as to whether or not the character Grimace is capable of love. <laughs> is that so much to ask? <laughs> oh my goodness. It'll be interesting which um, committee um, will that uh, fall under, you know, because there's like city council with like everybody and there's like actual co different committees. So yeah, I, I wonder where, like which part of, which agenda item for which meeting will that fall under? I mean, if you're bold enough, that's going to be agenda item one on day one. You know, Ooh. this is the power you'll be vested with. <laughs> so um, I guess we could, we should, I, sh I didn't introduce um, which word you're running for, but you're running for CP Winnie Walk. Am I, did that's I say correct. that right? Did I, is that yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. cool. And um, for context for people, because they reference um, former like boundaries also, which is totally cool. It is all of the former Ward 5 plus six neighborhoods of the former Ward 1 around here, around 87th Avenue. Yeah, it's really interesting how boundaries have been changed and merged. Like actually, um, I guess Ward Dene um, has been left out unscathed. So, you know, Ward 4, Ward Dene, it's all intact. And for mine, it's just two wards kind of combined together. But there are some wards where it's like little bits of like between four and five different uh, former wards, which is um, a bit confusing for, for the people there. So they, do, they have to do a lot of education, the candidates, I mean. Yeah, I, I do appreciate your use of the words like unscathed and intact, which sort of implies that like the redrawing of the ward boundaries has been a very destructive process. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's been real like, violent. Families like <laughs> split up by being across the street and they're looking at each other longingly through a chain link fence. Like, I'm sorry, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't realize it would be happening. And yeah. yeah, you must have been away that weekend, but it was rough. There was blood and shrapnel everywhere. <laughs> yeah. It's, you know what? It's, it's all in the name of, uh, you know, people having to go and remember which ward they live in. And that's, I guess that's a positive step. It was worth it was worth all the deaths of the reboundering. <laughs> um, so Giselle, you were talking about learning um, how to pronounce the new names of the wards, um, and I we, we uh, I kind of wanted to show that off a little bit because you it sounded like you really had them down. So what was the you you said you started with the hardest one? What was the what was the hardest one that you said about, you memorized? So the hardest one, which is the one that is a little bit of 
the former Ward 10, of course, there's a bit some boundary changes there. So that's um, Ipiko Kanipiotsi. Um, I think to spelling wise, it's like 20 letters or whatever. It means mm-hmm. land of the Thunderbirds, if I'm not mistaken. Sounds like a lovely name. Uh, yeah, so I started with that. So, you know, um, Epico Kanipiotsi. Um, CP Windowalk actually is also kind of like middle of the ground for difficulty. Um, with Ward O. Damon, it's actually not the spelling that, I mean, the pronunciation that confuses me. It's the spelling because it has an apostrophe and a dash in, you know, in every syllable. So, like, where do you put the dash? Where do you put the apostrophe? I get confused. Um, yeah, so um, Pihesuin is fine and, um, you know, Anangnak is fine because I have, um, you know, like, the the syllable. Um, there's a uh, comparable in the Philippine culture, so that's cool. And then, you know, the easier, like, Nakoda Iska, very straightforward. And same with um, Ward Meiti and Dene, you know, that's the easier ones um, on the um, end of the spectrum. Yeah. yeah. That's so cool. I mean, I think that if if this helps with Odaemon, that if you try to remember which one has a hyphen, which one has an apostrophe, you can just remember that if the apostrophe was first uh, and the hyphen was second, it would look like uh, a war named after an Irish person named Oday and also the minimum amount of it. Hmm. So as soon as you realize that's incorrect, you can just switch them around. Ah, okay. Sounds great. So did you want to, uh, I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you want to show off and pronounce all of them correctly? Yeah, for sure. So, And actually, I, I posted a few videos of that on Twitter uh, a while back just to encourage um, people to learn how to pronounce it. But um, yeah, so from the top, it would be, you know, Dakota Iska, Anangnak, Tasta Winnawak, Dene, Odaemin, Métis, Sipi Winnawak, Papa Steel, Pie Suin, Ipiko Kani Piotsi, um, Gareyo, and Spomitapi. And here's a bonus for you for Edmonton, Amiskwetsi was Kaigan. Oh, cool. Wow, you absolutely killed it. All right. I thought I was really proud that I learned to memorize the one ward we were talking about today. And once again, I am the resident fool. Well, you have some work to do before our next, next session. Uh, this is true. Uh, I mean, I do have my own ward down because uh, I've, I've been blessed with an extremely easy one, which is Papasteo. And it's easy to remember because, you know, whenever I can walk around, I just think, I think, I throw my hands up in the air sometimes, singing Ayo, Papasteo. And then you just, you know, how can, how can you forget that? <laughs> well done. Mnemonics are important. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, and uh, the, I, that's honestly all of the questions I had regarding uh, regarding pronunciation. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, the black card, mm-hmm. which I don't know what this could stand for other than "I love you" and also "I'm Joan Jet." But maybe maybe I can toss this one out to you guys and to our audience. We'll we'll put any comment on screen. Watch, watch. I'll put any comment on screen, even extremely trite comments like David's. I think that's very pertinent and an astute observation. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I, so for me, I, I always feel like a black heart is like, I always see it as like our love has shriveled and died. Um, <laughs> <laughs> having never received a black heart and only sent them, um, that's how I've meant everyone. Okay. Yeah, do you send a lot of these? I mean, everything's relative, and who's to say how much is a lot? Hmm. Um. You sure. got my text I, today, right? Um. I did. My phone receive it. Absolutely. Did I read mm-hmm. it? I'll leave that as an exercise from the audience. Okay. Well, there's one, I guess, if we're counting. All right. Well, I would like to get through at least the last of this top row of hearts before we get to our sincere questions, because I did, uh, I did receive a note from our producer before today's episode, which is of course, Nicole shadow producer of the show. And I, I was told to be on my best behavior and to only be sincere. So I I can only ask in the sincerest way possible. What on God's green earth does a brown heart mean? There's a brown heart. There is a brown heart. I mean, there is in Discord. I assume it's the same as everywhere. Let me look at 
my keyboard right now. Oh, wow. This is a great okay. idea because I don't know. I feel like if somebody gives me a brown heart, this is troubling. Like, you know, it's not a black heart, but they don't find our love to be colorful. So I, this is off topic, but I recently saw a spoken word poem about um, talking about how people, people wishing, or talking about someone wishing that they had blue eyes and it was a brown heart and talking about how, about all the beautiful things that are brown um, and how brown, your eyes are brown, like the earth that all of our food and our flowers and our trees grow from. And it's like the trees that are, and it was, it was really beautiful. Uh, if I find it, I can send it, but um yeah, I wouldn't necessarily take it as a bad thing. Um, I feel like I've only sent a brown heart if it's right next to a poop emoji. So, I mean, there's also that to consider, but we, we don't have to read too much into that. Well, I'm reading, I'm just looking at the, you know, heart emojis in my keyboard right now or in my, my phone. And it's interesting just because of like the lighting and an angle. It actually looks more like a bronze color instead of like, mm. you know, poop related brown, which is interesting. Mm. Yeah, because, you know, like a bronze heart might actually mean something in particular. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, bronze, like, bronze is a kind of a nicer way to describe brown things. Um, like, I feel like my poops would be a lot less embarrassing and shameful if I described them as bronze, so... <laughs> I, I might do that in the future. So wait, so so where have we landed? But what is what does the brown heart mean? Or sorry, what does the bronze heart mean? So I just looked it up because I knew that there's a bronze anniversary, um, and apparently it's the eighth anniversary. So maybe it means I love you when we've been married for eight years. That's a very specific emoji. <laughs> <laughs> so my emojis in my like samsung keyboard here i guess this is the google keyboard don't even give me the option of or no that's in my message app of the brown heart which means that i guess it means that they think people who have this phone are never gonna make it eight years in a relationship which i mean i feel really called out by that <laughs> <laughs> but can you say that it's inaccurate well that's why i feel called out because it's painfully accurate <laughs> Do you want to talk oh, about man. it? Uh, I really want to. I really want to talk about the inconsistency of emojis across devices because, my goodness, whenever I try to send, you know, uh, like I, I had uh, an Apple device for a while through work, and so uh, this was a this was a job where we had to talk about a lot of eye roll worthy things, and so you would use the eye roll emoji, which is very blatant. It's eyes straight up. That emoji does not look impressed, um, but. It turns out that same emoji when viewed on an Android phone is kind of an extremely like saucy emoji of someone going like, hey, and rolling their eyes to the side, mm. which is like just about the close to the opposite emotion as you can get. So I'm not too sure. I like this. How is this? How is this not being regulated? Like, why is the UN not stepping in and forcing the emojis to be the same? I don't know if this is maybe something you could run on, Giselle. I don't know if it's too late to update your campaign platform, but if you wanted to run an emoji standardization, I think that would be great. Oh, I wonder what kind of jurisdiction that would fall under. Mm, now, something I will pass on to my research team. <laughs> yeah. Can we also talk about, like, I feel like we need to have a discussion about people using inappropriate emojis or, like, emoji, emojis that seem off. Like, so... If you were to say, like, uh, if I were to receive a kissy face emoji, like, it's usually either from one of my close friends or my partner. Um, but I have an uncle, and I don't know if it's a cultural difference because he is from Switzerland, but he used to send me kissy emojis all the time as, like, a, okay, love you. This is not a weird thing, by the way. My uncle and I have a very platonic relationship. This is not... It's not weird. He means it in like a, in like a, just a very light, like, okay, good talking to you. Have a nice day kind of way. But it's a kissy emoji. And I'm like, how do I explain to him that this is weird? Like, is there like a PSA that we can put out to be like, hey, kissy emojis are for 
partners or like close friends if you know each other like that, but like maybe not between family. Hmm. Is your is sorry, this is your uncle you said? Yes. Is he Italian? He's I Swiss. was about to ask, actually. <laughs> yeah. Italian. Yeah. He yeah. is Swiss, which is I hear from yeah. people from that live in that have lived in Europe is the opposite of Italian. The complete <laughs> the complete opposite. So no yes. like the double cheek kiss kissy beso situation. Yeah, like, yeah. Oh. Actually that's not true. Actually, they do do the they do, do the double kiss in Switzerland. Oh, okay. Which was so really awkward that. when I was in Switzerland and then I went to France and they only did one kiss in France. So I was always going in for a second one and it was like this whole like <laughs> whole situation. Yeah, maybe oh. that's the emoji for the double kiss thingy. I don't know. Mm -hmm. That's, ah, uh, okay, that's all coming together now. Yep. It is a cultural difference. Mm -hmm. All right, so, okay, I only have one more insincere question before we get to the real questions. And by that, this is actually a very sincere question. I just, everyone's gonna read it as as different. But, so all, all of us here on the show, I would say it's it's fair to say that we're single issue voters. And my single issue is plastic lawn signs, which I think should be banned. And I'm wondering if I could get you to run on this platform because I will move to your ward in the next month to vote for you if you say yes. Well, here's the interesting thing. Like as a first time candidate, it's really confusing. Like what, you know, what's the Canadian cultural, you know, what are you supposed to do to run a campaign here? And yeah, like I felt really torn up about getting law and science, but here's where I give myself some comfort. I, like, and this is actually legit. Like I'm an abstract artist using recycled materials. So um, I'm going to have enough canvases to put paintings for the rest of my life if you know regardless of the outcome of the election so yeah um i don't know like it um i've heard sentiments like there's so many people who actually would prefer not to have a plastic lawn sign so i, I think you actually have you know there's some there's some merit there or i don't know like, what could be something that would be like biodegradable or kind of cool like i don't know like bubbles that will like so that you you know after election day you like pop them and then they disappear. I don't know like <laughs> so there's some kind of like technology like that I, that that would I would be I would be for that. So, Holograph. are you saying actually that you like you the the signs you put up have been made of like recyclable materials or that was just a thing you wanted to do? Um, no, it's just something I wanted to do. So, like, after mm. the election, yeah, like, um, because because they're actually pretty decent material. Like, you know, like, they're 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 flat, they're sturdy, they're, you know, a, a decent size to make paintings on, uh, which I've done before. Um, I've done paintings on um, picture frames, like the glass, like, actual, like, picture, picture frames, um, cork boards, um, white, white boards. Yeah, yeah, so uh, definitely doable. Oh, so, like, the, the ones that you have put out like you are going to keep them and use them for like a lifetime's worth of canvases yeah mm -hmm. that's actually a pretty cool idea um i mean you could even like give them out to like just say hey i have this man like how many would you say that you have had made for this election yeah i'm happy to share um i had 500 of these little guys and i have 50 of the large ones which is four feet by four feet Okay, yeah. So I mean, you can you could give away signs to like four hundred people in your in your ward and still have more than enough canvases left over. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a legitimately cool idea, and I do believe that this could be a cross partisan issue because I I don't think I've ever met anyone who's like, no, we need these. Like, no one loves them. Like, we just kind of do it. I think as a matter of routine. And I mean, for every single candidate that's ever. I mean, even if somebody has won an election, they're not going to reuse their signs because they have you have to write reelect, right? If you've been elected, like you can't just you can't just paint it on your old sign. Of course. Then... Yeah, you could put stickers though, which is actually what I did for my lawn signs. Here's a you know honest confession for you guys: I made a typo on the ward name on my lawn signs, which was <gasps> stressful. So I'm tweeting this out right now. I'm just kidding. I don't have a Twitter. Go on. <laughs> so, but what I did is I was able to order from the same company, uh, like a vinyl sticker, uh, stickers, 
um, and then just like paste it on. So it, it was an easy fix. So my hope, you know, in the future, I think, yeah, just like on the corner, like this corner of the lawn sign, maybe I'll put a sticker there, like re-elect or something like that. Yeah. So at, at least that's the idea. Or um, maybe, or maybe, or maybe I'll actually like calligraphy paint it myself. Who knows? Because I mm -hmm. I can do that. So artistic mm -hmm. touch. <laughs> so did you have like a little like working bee with like your friends? You got everyone together to like stick the vinyl stickers on of on all of your lawn signs, or did you just have to do that all yourself? Yeah, I pretty much did it myself, but it's more of like a cathartic experience because like while I was like putting the stickers, I was blasting like classic 90s Philippine pop music that I grew up in and it's it's pretty incredible. So like mm -hmm. it's the like really like loud, like belting romantic, like I love you so much kind of songs and mm -hmm. it's great. So yeah, that's uh, you know, it's a way to uh, do campaign related stuff that's more like physical instead of you know um arguing about platforms so mm -hmm. it's a good break <laughs> yeah it's like a sea shanty while you're working just like perfect yep nice that's right can you give an example of a like classic 90s philippine pop song oh geez does it have oh it I need to give you English ones or what? Or I don't know. I was just going to, if it, if it can be found on YouTube, I was going to start blasting it in the stream. Well, I will give you a name. Uh, I'll, I might as well give you the name of the artist I was listening to. I'll put it in the chat, but their name is AGs. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if you mention that to like any like millennial and older um, Filipino person, they will recognize it. They're, they're amazing. They're um, it, the, the, Vocalists are usually like uh, the two, like two women, like sisters, I believe. But sometimes they have uh, their um, male um, guitarist uh, and doing a duet with one of the ladies. Um, yeah, love, lo lo love it, love it. Um, also, a common um, common uh, artist in um, every karaoke machine you see in the Filipino home. So, <laughs> yeah. So that that is it's uh, quite convenient that I actually found a YouTube video that is. It, almost exactly two hours of nonstop ages songs. Yep. <laughs> and for for this being a two hour show, like we've really missed the boat here. We could have just simply played this from the minute one of the show and had a constant background music. That's awesome. um, yeah, that would have been great. In fact, if you guys just want to abandon everything we've done so far and then we can just start over from there. Yeah, that'd be great. I have All a right. Uh, yeah, I mean, who? I mean, we all do, right? None of us are busy. None of us are doing anything. I don't know, important, are we? Like, it's not like we're running for office here. <laughs> uh, yeah. So go ahead and stall for me, Nicole, while I remember how to share my edge tabs. No, I figured it out again. All right. So here we have the ages nonstop songs. Oh, heck yeah! <laughs> oh yeah. It? Look at that overall with the one strap undone. That's classic. I I should go for that look. This is what I need. Mm -hmm. Because I'm look just wearing out. a t-shirt. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. oh, yeah. oh, 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 Betrayal and romance. So I might as well like, translate the gist of the song. And yeah, I don't know how Wong can play this without being in trouble for copyright or whatever. So I, I don't know how that works. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, I feel like if we talk over it the entire time without pause, we can't get DMC'd. But this is the kind of thing a smart person would look up uh, <laughs> before they get, you know, the, before they start committing to this. So um, you could be right. It's possible I should just stop <laughs> yeah but um well I'm, like i mentioned like that particular song really popular back then but yeah like that talks about you know like that late this the singer is like very very angry you know betrayal you know like i thought you were mine i thought you are true to me but you broke my heart like that's literally what mm. the lyrics were mm. is that the white heart is <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Because we do have to have something for the white heart. And I feel like there's some truly awful people on Twitter who will try to co-opt it as like their secret white supremacy heart. And so we have to we have to get ahead of them. Mm -hmm. We have to get it we have to get ahead of them by calling it the betrayal heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Reasonable people might argue that that's what the broken heart emoji is for, but I refuse to be a reasonable person. So 
Yeah, we're aware. So getting on to the sincere questions, uh, I do have a confession to make, which is that I was really gung-ho about reading up on your entire campaign platform today and you know maybe watching some of the videos you posted. Uh, and instead, I pottered around while eating breakfast and I went for a long walk today. And it turns out I didn't actually look at anything. So for the sake of me, if no one else, uh, like if you had to kind of give a 30 second elevator pitch for what you're running on, what would that be? Well, my quick pitch, which I also use at the doors, is that I am running to fight for the benefit of everyday Edmontonians, those that actually rely on basic um, city services, making sure that um, all these services provided by the municipality work well for everyday life, and that people who um, contribute, you know, taxpayers also feel that they, they are contributing well and have good value of the money that they are contributing to our society. But yes, fighting for everyday Edmontonians. That's my, that is the most concise version of it. Mm -hmm. What kind of like response do you find you get just as a candidate knocking door to door? Because I mean, politics, as we know, is, you know, famous for how calm it makes people and how no one ever tires of talking about it. So like, yeah, like, like do you find that... Um, yeah, I don't know if you could describe kind of how people have been in your interactions with them. Like, how do they, how much do they want to listen to what a door to door candidate has to say? It's really interesting, you know, as a first time candidate and an immigrant who was also familiar with a different political system before moving here. I was 16 when I moved here. So it's really fascinating to observe how people behave at the doors. I mean, it, I mean, the reality is most people actually don't open. So, you know, the sample size significantly shrinks then, right? But uh, for those that do open um, the doors, many are actually pretty, um, you know, they're not, they are really not paying too, too much attention just yet about municipal uh, politics because of the federal election that just concluded. And also because there's a bit of um, confusion in, um, you know, what municipal governments actually do because there's less... Uh, drama about it uh, when it comes to the news cycle, if that makes sense. For totally. those that, um, so sometimes when I have to ask, when I ask questions, I actually prompt them by listing out the different things that the city does, you know, any questions about transit, property taxes, snow clearing, garbage, libraries, police, and sometimes that prompts uh, questions. Um, so there's a lot of questions uh, I get about, um, you know, taxes, property taxes, um, spending or feeling that they're not getting their value out of it. Um, depending on the neighborhood here in CP Wilnawak, um, we all of us, most of us here on the West End just got our garbage bins. So it's a bit of a learning curve. And I've been getting some uh, um, complaints and concerns about that. It becomes an educational opportunity. I tell them that. If you have a seven plus person household, you can order a bigger bin and they're like, what? Or, you know, like this is actually how the schedule works and get really informative um, for them. Uh, transit is a big one, especially since about four to five neighborhoods here in the ward are now um, going through the pilot project of the on-demand uh, bus system. Um, just like my neighborhood, half of my transit trips are now in the um, on-demand bus system. Um, some had mentioned uh, concerns about accessibility, snow clearing, and uh, you know, just making sure that every every single like infrastructure in our community, a person in a wheelchair can actually get to. The answer is hardly no, it's not the case at all. It's remarkable how many steps are stairs are in every house, but you know, that's a I'll I'll, I'll rant about that another day. Um, yeah, so it's a little bit of everything and. Whenever I get someone at the door who's a permanent resident, uh, they're like, sorry, not yet a citizen. I also take that as an opportunity to educate and tell them that, um, yeah, sure, you cannot vote yet. But um, what we decide on, it's the most like, tangible uh, way that governments impact communities. So if we have issues about transit and snow, snow clearing and whatnot, let me know. So, yeah, that's kind of what I have been uh, uh, getting at the doors. Okay. So, sorry, you talked a bit about the on-demand bus system. What is that? Yeah. So, my uh, 
my more, uh, I guess, fun analogy, it's like Uber and an airport shuttle had a baby. Like, that's kind of how I describe it. But mm-hmm. basically what happened is, you know, the city had a citywide bus network um, redesign. It took them two years to do consultations. And the big uh, dilemma, I suppose, or the question they posed to the community is that the city has grown a lot, but the transit budget is still the same. So looking at these routes, you have to make a choice. Do you want more frequent routes, but you might have to walk a little bit more? Or do you want, uh, you know, yeah, it's a frequency versus um, coverage trade-off. And then for certain neighborhoods here in the West End and many other parts of the city where it's still like a brand new neighborhood, so ridership is really not quite there yet, or we, it's just like so isolated that um, ridership has been low for a while, um, they decided that, to, to not have a frequent or like a, a, a standard bus route with like the big bus and have this on-demand bus instead. So you you phone or you um, book online or you th- or through the app, you, um, you, you book a pickup time and then you go to the designated stop, it picks you up and then it takes you to a transit station or another... Uh, neighborhood nearby that has the on-demand um, system or to a major road. So for me here in um, Rio Terrace, it can take me to Cameron Heights. It could take me to West Edmonton Mall, Meadowlark, and some of the neighborhoods around like Parkview and Sherwood. But um, yeah, I mean, I had to be an expert at it because of necessity. So I also take that as an opportunity to discuss it with people because people are really upset that it, it, it that their neighborhood has has, has lost their frequent nice big bus and now had this on-demand bus system instead and i tell them that i'm not thrilled about it either but like seriously please give it a try and give like constructive feedback when scheduling and capacity and whatnot yeah Mm -hmm. overall um, yeah it's it's actually working okay i can see the merits of it and um yeah it's already september so there's just about a year and a half left in the pilot project Right, right. Because so you don't you. I saw in your uh, website it says you don't drive, so you take transit exclusively. So you can Uber, kinda, walking, yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Which is a, a cool perspective to have when you're running for like city councilor, right? Because I don't know how many city councilors have that point of view. Um, and so yeah. like having that, having to work with that for, firsthand is a pretty cool. Um, I guess it gives you a good handle, I guess, on it. That's yeah, cool. absolutely. I mean, some counselors, or I think even the mayor, like they do take transit sometimes. Like there are actually times like I see them on the LRT and whatnot, but it's a different frame of mind when you cannot drive and when you miss the bus and you're like, oh crap, I'm stranded, which has happened to me many, many times, whether at West Edmonton Mall at the university, South Campus, um, and all of those some um, different places. So yeah, like there's a it's a it's a different way of living in the city if you're unable to drive. So yeah, and I really want to bring that perspective um, with my community engagement. It's also why I volunteered for three years for the Edmonton Transit Advisory Board, which we do have in the city. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, like I, I would even add to what you're saying is that like. So I, I I grew up in, you know, the deep suburbs. And so it was, you know, the 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 buses there are effectively the, just for show. I mean, the it's a it's a whole lifestyle and environment where it's it's simply like a given that you're just going to get a car. You know, it's just uh, you live in a place that's not transit accessible and it tends to be filled with people that are very affluent. And it was just I have had access to a car since I was a teenager. And it was only kind of later on and learning about um, like urban planning in school and learning about transit that you go, oh, wow, like there's this whole metro area is really a bit of a swing and a miss on setting up for transit because, you know, cities like ours were built at a time where transit was like seen as like, or, or, or I should say that like the cars were seen as the way of the future. And when the environment is so built for cars, like, you can only make the buses so good. And so I, as somebody who owns a car and, you know, has benefited from that and really wants to use transit more, it's it's prohibitively difficult so often in that, like, it's, you know, even the car aside, like, it's faster to ride my bike most places than it is to take transit. But, you know, in winter, that doesn't work. And so as, and, uh, as somebody who has 
already committed to the expenses of owning a car, the, the registration and the insurance. Um, for me, looking at a bus fare that is, you know, costing me six dollars now to go anywhere, um, or committing to another hundred dollars a month for the pass, it's 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 prohibitively expensive to get into transit because you know I I make enough money to maintain a car, but not enough really to have the luxury of throwing on a transit pass on top of that. So I've I've often kind of found that's one of the like frustrations I've had from living in Edmonton is, you know, I've been to cities with wonderful transit and it's, I just wish I could explain to people how nice it is to mm -hmm. be able to like, like imagine living somewhere where somewhere is across town and you can, you can hop buses on there and you, you'll never want for a car, you know, like that's how it was in, in Seoul and Tokyo and Kobe and places like that, that I went. And it was so, it's so frustrating to come back here and it's just this endless expanse of asphalt and yeah, so I don't know if I should lead up to a question here. That was just my rant, but. Mm -hmm. No, well, one thing um, that's probably worth mentioning, and I am personally looking forward to, is we are um, entering the modern times and we are going to have a digital way to um, pay for transit fare. You, It's the ARC card system. It's like the Metro Pass that uh, New York City has. So we are finally getting it soon um it's going through it, it has a it's going through like a pilot stage right now so not everyone has access to it i think full mm. implementation is 2022 but yes since i take the bus on a regular basis sometimes carrying the lawn signs to do campaign related mm. errands um yeah i have seen people um enter you know tap the card onto the machine and hear like that beep and then you know on their way out they tap it again and i'm like this is real okay i'm excited so it's happening mm. soon yeah. Yeah, that's um it's and it's funny when to see things like that even being a pilot because there's a part of me that goes like, you know, like what are we piloting? This has been done in in many cities like we know it works. I we know. we like just do it, just implement it because it's it's I know people have described coming to Edmonton and just being shocked that uh uh like n not only do we not have the like the tap cards as so many cities do, but even uh, I think it was like that you still couldn't buy the tickets at the station with a credit card, like it was cash only, or am I misremembering that? That's correct. I'm, I've experienced that firsthand. So when I went to Calgary for, uh, for an errand at the Philippine consulate and they were like, oh, that, that thing that says debit, like that actually works. Oh, I was so shocked and I was nerding out. I was like live tweeting my transit trips in Calgary all day because I was so excited. But um, yes, um, over here, it, the debit machine doesn't work. Um, now, though, again, because I'm, I've seen it quite a bit, I suppose this is part of the, uh, you know, um, full launch of the ARC card. The new machines um, in the transit stations, I've seen it in South Campus that yeah, there's uh, there's the old machine where you can buy tickets and stuff. And then there's the new one right beside it um, where you can, I suppose, like refill your um, ARC card. And there's like, um, you know, like the symbol for when you pay tap on like a typical debit or credit machine in a store, like the, the mm -hmm. thingy is there too. So I'm, uh, so they're, they're, they're building an infrastructure. So. Hopefully it'll be there finally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. That's um that's always been a frustrating thing for me because I also I have a car, but I try to take transit. But yeah, it's I have a whole other rant, but that's about the Calgary transit system and has nothing to do with you guys, so I'll leave it out of here. But um it's it's always so frustrating when you're like, you know, I have even it, like to get on the bus, it's like I have I have a twenty dollar bill, and I have a credit card, and I have a debit card, but I can't get on the bus because I don't have three fifty and change. Um, mm -hmm. And it's very frustrating, and it's like makes no sense. I'm like, why? Why do I even have all these things ways to pay for things if I can't pay for like the one thing that I need right now? Oh yeah, but. totally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious. You you mentioned uh, that you were making an errand to the like the Philippine uh, consulate. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I think that'd be like a unique perspective to hear about, like, what is your kind of, like, I mean, wait, what were you doing there that day? But like, what is your relationship as a, uh, as an immigrant to like your country of origin? Like, I don't know if you have anything to speak on there. Oh boy, where do I begin? That's why I have a blog on this. And I and actually, yeah, it's worth sharing. Like I do have a personal blog where I documented my life story and, um, I'm starting to, it, it's it's a bit of an emotionally draining experience to share like my life story, but I, whenever I get requests from 
um, different projects, you know, like share to me your life story. And I'm like, yeah, of course, I'm more than happy to because um, there's a lot of these projects now, you know, collecting stories of immigrants from all over the country. And there's different ways that it's presented, you know, like I contributed to an anthology of Edmonton immigrants and I contributed to an um, anthology of like, you know, I guess amazing, you know, 150 immigrant women. I'm like, oh, okay, sure, I'll, I'll pass my story. But um, I guess long story short, um, I was 16 when I moved here. And I, you know, before that, I grew up in the northern Philippines, um, you know, mountain region and that kind of stuff. Um, uh, my brother and I are orphans, like our parents died in a, well, we were there too. Like we had like a very like bad like vehicle accident and uh, my my parents and sister and a lot of other people didn't make it. My brother and I um, survived. And um, it's really, I guess it's really an educational moment for um, Canadians, how I got into Canada because, you know, there's a sponsorship process and everything, right? I was sponsored through the category of family class for orphans. So normally you cannot sponsor nieces or nephews. They're too, like the relationship is too far removed with the exemption of fully orphaned kids. So that's how I got to Canada. And um, and because I was 16 when I moved uh, here, you know, I'm pretty uh, familiar with the culture. I'm old enough to have like memories and my viewpoint in life shaped by um, what I experienced growing up. But 16 is such a important age and stage for of a teenager's life you know what i mean so a lot of my young adult experiences are here and um, i remember growing up because you know i'm a pretty academically competitive person like english class like language and grammar are actually my favorite classes like i get like high 90s in english so um so adapting to here is actually um a bit easier of course i speak still a little bit like formally and if you give me a sentence i can break down its grammatical components like i we have, we've learned that growing up but um yeah like um, in, in my household, my brother and I, for the most part, now we still speak Tagalog to each other, except for his first year when he came here, because he came four years after me. And I'm like, I'm going to train you. I'm going <laughs> to talk to you only in English. And, you know, I'm going to take you to West Edmonton Mall and you're going to order our food and, you know, just to get his uh, comfort level. Um, yeah, I got... I got my citizenship in 2012 and I'm still considering doing my dual citizenship. The paperwork is just a little bit like um, challenging. Um, with my relatives, um, a few of them are in Edmonton in, um, or in Canada, but I have relatives um, all over the world. So um, yeah, it's it's been a really fluid process trying to like reconnect or stay involved with my cultural community while letting my own values evolve because you know i guess i have a bit of an outsider's perspective there's some cultural things that i really don't like um for example the concept of filipino time which is just being casually chronically late for everything <laughs> i hate it like i i'm very respectful of people's time I want to arrive early and get things done on time. So I, I'm like rejecting that entire cultural premise altogether. Um, but yeah, like, you know, my I think my language proficiency is pretty okay, although I get rusty with certain like common um, conversational words, which makes me worried. But um, yeah, like my husband is a born and raised Edmontonian. So that's mm. another like that we'll definitely explore as we as we get older he has been to the philippines a few times and what really surprised me is that all the fancy touristy places we've been to because we've, and we've been to a lot we went there for three months um he they, he finds them like kind of nice but what he really loved is the quaint little mining village where i grew up because it's so far it's so remote environmentally it's like actually like nice and pretty and cool we have pine trees there so like it's that cool like evergreens everywhere um but um yeah so it's a bit of a, a rant but uh yeah like that's kind of you know it's a, it's an evolving process right like staying connected to my uh my um my cultural community and identity i describe myself as filipino canadian um you know, i find it a bit awkward sometimes when um, people ask me right away if I'm Filipino or not. And like, and I was like, yes, I am. Or I guess it depends on who asks. Like, if it's like a fellow Filipino who asks, I feel a little bit more okay. But if it's a non-Filipino who asks, um, it's, it's a little bit awkward because um, what's the term that I like using? 
the occupational stereotyping comes up immediately afterwards when they're like, oh, you're Filipino? My nanny's Filipino. (laughs) All the healthcare workers I know are Filipino and I have mixed feelings about it. You know what I mean? Like on one hand, it's true. And at the same time, like we're here, like the younger generation Filipino Canadians who are, who don't fit in that stereotype anymore. So yeah, it's a, it's, it's a, it's, it's a journey in itself. Let's just put it that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we should probably pivot soon. I wanted to ask kind of one more question because sure. I know you'd alluded to the kind of the idea of, you know, people are maybe a little less interested in local politics or less invigorated by it because part of it is the news cycle. And part of it is that it, I think it's, I'm guilty of this as anyone, it's easy to feel like the national politics matter the most or even mm-hmm. in some cases, the national politics of another country. But it's, mm-hmm. yeah, it's amazing how much of our everyday life is, you know, shaped by being able to add maybe more think and act local. Um, but I'm also, I'm curious because uh, what you think of this, because I think to me, what should be like the main issue we're talking about in most elections now is climate. Um, it's, I think it's, extraordinarily under talked about considering the degree to which we're barreling towards collapse. So I, I, I'm kind of interested in your thoughts of how you view your role in that as like a, as a municipal candidate, like what can we do at the municipal level that's, that's worth anything? Um, I think this is a lot of work because um, not only do we need to like, do it like volume wise, like do it a lot, but to do it in different ways and languages, for lack of a better word, like education, I think is a really, really big component to it, to this, because um, in, in a way that demonstrates what is the impact of municipal politics. And from an, from an immigrant's perspective, to do an appropriate and comprehensive contrast, how different is municipal politics here compared to wherever we came from. Um, this is a bit of a side note, and I think this is why a lot of you know, my fellow immigrants kind of like check out, is um, many of us come from countries where politics is so much more violent. Um, when I told my brother I'm running for office, he was like legit scared because like, in the Philippines, in many places, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of how many local politicians will get murdered after this political election cycle. So, um, so, and, and when you migrate to a different country, like the, the idea is that you've already left the environment that you love and over here, it's mostly like survival. So, you know, like work your ass off, like two to three jobs. And, um, you know, I suppose when, if, and when, which takes a while, um, you get your citizenship, then you go and vote. Imagine someone who's been here maybe as a temporary foreign worker for five years and then a permanent resident for five years. And then there's like chaos with their citizenship application. And then they got their citizenship four years after. 14 years living in Canada, never had a chance to vote. So how how, how can you even like educate and tell people to get engaged before they're able to vote? And then addressing the like misconceptions or like not feeling like you belong in the political conversation in this country. So that's, a, and that's a huge one because people come to Canada at under like different types of visas and whatnot. And um, if, for instance, if you've been, uh, if you've hold like certain jobs and, you know, have never been part of your community league or whatever, like you feel entirely like disconnected from political discourse during your entire time in Canada. And then, so like flipping it to the born and raised Canadians, for lack of a better word. Um, yeah, I think um, I'm starting to learn that you guys here um, learn about civics in grade six. You know, there's like City Hall School or whatever. At least that's the case here in Edmonton. I really think that um, incorporating it, it, incorporating it more in other classes in junior high and high school. Um, you can tell, like, I didn't go to high school here. I think you guys have a thing here called Calm, you know, like yeah. high skills course or whatever. So incorporating it there might also be handy. Um, and um, and yeah, and part of and then another angle that I have noticed is. I know there's a, like uh, the budget of a city councilor is very limited, so it's not like they can send you know the same like amount of like male 
brochure things as like federal politicians or whatever. But I think um, constant like presence and communicating would actually help a lot. And that's how that's why I do my videos and social media and whatnot. It's really it's really reaching out to a lot of people who are not um, really engaged or are not very aware of how things work municipally and um, I think I think it's making at least a little bit of an impact but yeah like a lot of I guess continuous relentless like educating I think and you know telling people why is it important probably translating it in different languages um, yeah there's a lot of uh, communication I think that uh, that needs to happen to help change the mindset as far as uh, impact of municipal government yeah, and I think it would be nice to kind of um, be able to change that, um, like what you specifically alluded to about the fact that even permanent residents aren't able to vote on the issues of places that they do live. And I, I, I kind of personally think there is a lot tied into like what to me is... I don't know, just dumb and sucky about the whole immigration system in that it's it does so much gatekeeping towards people for the crime of being born on a different patch of dirt. And I don't know, I feel like we could get into this, but this is probably another hours long rant. And we probably <laughs> should bring out our uh, our GM here, Josh, because I know he's got uh, he's got a comprehensive um, platform for immigration reform that he's just dying to share. So, <laughs> yeah, we can bring out Josh right now. <laughs> oh man, I even get my own uh, 